What up, YouTube? It's time to brew some beer. Today I'm gonna to be trying a brand new recipe. I'm gonna be doing an oatmeal stout, which I've never done before, with a twist. I'm gonna be adding peanut butter. Make a peanut butter oatmeal stout. Let's get started. And the desire to go all stainless steel, um, got another one of these uh, Bayou Classics off of eBay. I'll put the link in the description. And you can see all three of my pots now are the Bayou Classic. I know it's not the most insulated, high-end um, pot that you can buy for brewing, but for a home brewer like me, it is the most economical stainless steel pot that you can get. These pots also come with the markings on the inside for your uh, your gallon markers, which is nice. The two holes so that I could put the valve on it and the thermometer. You can also get ones, you know, with just the one hole for the valve at the bottom. And if you need to, you can just cut more holes in them like I did here to make my Herm system. We're looking to get just under four gallons at 165. Correction, 168. The only thing I don't like about this gauge as opposed to one that I had on my old mash time was this one doesn't have a little tick marker where you can mark where you're, uh, you know, you can set a temperature that you want to hold it at. What I liked about that was when I came out here to check, I could just look from the stairs, see if the, the marker is still pointed at the tick marker, we're good. But I'm pretty sure I can MacGyver some shit and make that tick marker work. The false bottom that I had in the previous mash time still works for this guy, which is nice. I picked up all these grains off of uh, adventuresinhomebrewing.com. I flip flop between them and um, Midwest Supplies. It's based on pricing and availability. Strong coffee smell to it. Now, this is going to be a new uncharted territory for me because with the old system with the cooler, I knew that if I kept this at 154, it would keep this at 152. I'm guessing just because of the lack of insulation on this guy, I'm probably going to have to get this water up here higher to maintain my 152. Get that lit, take a sip. Let's get all of it. This is what I've been using to maintain my water perth from batch to batch. Just a whole home water filter. Takes out the chlorine and the chromium to make you think to change the flavor. Very cost effective. Way easier than buying bottled water like I was before. I'm not gonna start my recirculation until I get this up to We'll say 156. We'll start with there and see what that does um, for a whole new temperature in here, 152. Right now, I'm just recirculating it through here so it heats up evenly. And we got ways to go. Since we're at 152, we are mashing in. So I changed my mind. I'm going to go with 154 and see where that gets us. This is, uh, this is holding temperature surprisingly well compared to the cooler I was using before as a mash time. So, we're going to start at 154 and we're going to see what that does for the temperature and mash time. You know, I'm just kind of checking that flow rate. I keep it at a fairly low flow rate. If the flow rate's too high, it actually is detrimental. Interestingly enough, we're about halfway through the mash and surprise, surprise, the numbers are the same, even with the, uh, without using a cooler for the mash time, without the insulation. 154 here still holds 152. So. Don't need to change anything, except this is going to be a lot easier to clean. And it just looks better. Mash is done. So right now what we're doing is um, kick the flame up to high, and we're trying to bring the mash temperature up to 190. That's our mash out. And then we'll sparge and start to boil. What I'm doing now is I'm bringing this guy up to 190. That's the mash out which means basically I'm bringing this up to 190, continue the recirculation. Once everything hits 190, then I'm gonna do my sparge, start my boil, and I'll go from there. We hit 
get our temperatures. We're getting ready to start um, our sparge. We're just getting the plumbing set up for that. We'll be uh, pulling out of here and draining into there. And then we'll be slowly pulling out of here and trickling hot water, 190 degree water on the top of the mash bed. As I'm setting that, to, that uh, hose right above the water line. The reason I do that is so that when I'm trying to match the flow rate of water into here with the flow rate of beer into the boil kettle, if I see this drop or rise, I know that I need to adjust my valves. So this is the time consuming, tedious version of the auto sparge. Show sure, you guys a couple uh, more pieces of gear that I picked up since the last brew session that I, uh, that I filmed. So I got these hot baskets, okay? Um, originally I bought this one, this was a large hot basket. I got both of these um, off of Amazon. I'm pretty sure I got them off of Amazon. I will throw the links up in the description. The problem with this one, the main problem, I liked it because it was big. Uh, and I thought like if I'm doing, if I'm putting a lot of spices and stuff like that in there, it will work. The problem with this one is, it actually sits on the bottom of the boil kettle. And my fear is that it's gonna start scorching stuff down here because there's no good, you know, wart flow. It was this guy. It's a smaller one, it has less volume. Um, but as you see, it hangs right off the side. Our flow rates are pretty good. So what we do now, or what I do now, I don't know what you guys do now, is switch this over so that I can start getting um, some heat underneath the wart so it doesn't take so long to get it up to boiling temperature. Here we are on about 5.75, which is what the recipe calls for. Um, I am going to run off just a little bit more because I got too much water in here and I don't want to waste any sugars. So typically what I like to do is get it right where I, when I get close to stop adding water into this so it really drains out the last bit. I was a little off this time. You know, so I'm sending a little bit of this stuff away, but I don't want to get the pre-boil volume too high because then I have to try and boil off too much. And it just takes too long. Now this is sitting up and out of the way, which is great, but really that's the only amount of this basket that's actually in the wart. And that is at a six gallon pre-boil volume. So once I'm done using the uh, hot water for it to sparge with, I just throw some PBR in there and then I let it run through the pump and through the, the whole uh, Hermes coil in there um, and just let it clean everything out. As most home brewers know, most of the time you spend brewing is, is cleaning. Um, and you gotta be meticulous. Now I am happy that I have this stainless steel because this stainless steel mash tub not only gonna last longer, but it's gonna be a heck of a lot easier to clean. And we are real close to our hot break. Now it's time for our bittering hops edition. I have found it. Oh, geez. oh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. So this is why I start cleaning around this time because you want to be out here when this happens so that you can prevent boil overs. Because you see how easy it is to clean this nice stainless steel inside? Not so much when it boils over and then cooks onto the outside for 60 minutes. All right, let's get to work. Which means let's get to hopping. We got a half ounce of bittery hops. As you guys know, these oatmeal stouts are, I missed. These oatmeal stouts are not that bitter. We got our bittering hops in there, <laughs> which is to say in there and not in there, muscle memory. And now we're just gonna start a boil timer for 60 minutes. Timer just went off, time to add our second hop addition, our Warflick tablet. One ounce of uh, Aliurta. I'm actually gonna try this, uh, this basket since I gotta clean it anyway. At this point, I also have my wart chiller to get it sterilized. And I can see a problem here.
So a lot of issues with using this hop basket, as you can see. Another thing I like to do once I get a high rolling boil on this is I like to run the boiling water through my uh, whirlpool pump just to make sure everything's sanitized. Now we're going to add the peanut butter. And yes, this is going to clump like hell because that's what it's designed to do. And this is powdered peanut butter. I got this off of, uh, I believe I got this off of Amazon. I'll include the link down at the bottom. But I use this for my um, Sweet Baby Jesus clone recipe that I did. The chocolate, be chocolate peanut butter porter. Be mindful when you add the peanut butter that you gotta turn the temperature down and stay on top of this. It's a five gallon batch, but just because of the nature of that powdered uh, peanut butter mix, it will make it foam a lot. And uh, <laughs> you do not wanna boil over with this peanut butter mix. That will be sticky as hell. Final hot addition here for the last five minutes. And uh, I ain't using that basket no more. So we're gonna go half an ounce of the huerta, and I'll just keep that for later on. So basically, as far as I can tell, this thing pretty much just clogged. That's time. Start the whirlpool pump. Got the flame. Start the work chart. I'm pretty happy with this or with the design of this guy. This will be the first time I've actually used it. This is an anvil conical bottom uh, fermenter for uh, it, it's seven and a half. Seven and a half? Sorry, seven gallons. I'm gonna give this one a go. Um, I like just the design of it. The dip tube on this one, which turns with the spigot on the outside, just like on the SS brew bucket. This one goes all the way down to almost the bottom to use it to pull off your trump, do a secondary fermentation in the same pail. Get this guy sanitized. And this is star sand. This is gonna ferment probably about seven days at 68 degrees, but I will be checking it when it gets to where I want it. That's when I drop the temperature down to stop it from burning anymore once I get the flavor that I want. When you're doing these other weird additives like peanut butter and stuff like that, and the last one you saw, the Captain Crunch, you have to, it'll ferment out further than you really want it to to get the flavor profile that you want. So you gotta start taking samples um, before you think it's done so that if it has the sweetness and the flavor that you want, but it's still gonna continue to ferment out more sugars, you can crash the temperature down so that uh, it, it gets, keeps the flavor you want. It has, a it has a strong chocolate smell to it right now. Chocolate and coffee. I've never made a oatmeal style before, and against my better judgment, instead of just following a basic oatmeal style recipe, I thought, you got powdered peanut butter. What'd it do? Give you guys a peek at my fermentation chamber here. A cheap old mini fridge. I just took this um, Inkbird temperature controller to it. You see, I got the fridge plugged into the cold side, so it'll kick on the fridge itself whenever the temperature is too low. I've got the um, heat side hooked into this guy. This is a ceramic heat lamp that's used for reptile enclosures to try and heat it up. This is a CPU fan. Um, I'll have a link for this too. Uh, this is just plugged in to a regular outlet. It's just a very, very low draw CPU fan that's designed to run constantly. I use that just to circulate the air throughout this whole thing. Our volume into the fermenter was 5.15 gallons, just a smidge under the 5.25 I usually shoot for, but we don't have a lot of hops or other things added to this that we're gonna be coming out of the truck. So now we're gonna add our, uh, our yeast, and this is a yeast starter. This has been going since yesterday. I've been pulling off samples from time to time. We fermented this for, uh, 15 days, called for a 14 day fermentation. Uh, the final gravity was supposed to be, as per the recipe, was supposed to be 1.016, but I do all these things to flavor. So we started off at 1.066, which is a little bit higher than it should have started. 
uh, we're at 1.021 um, and the flavor is where I want it. It still has a little bit of sweetness to it, which I want. So I cold crashed it after I pulled that out. It was about two days ago. I cold crashed it down to 44, which is what I serve it at and to stop the fermentation, let it set a little bit. Because there's gonna be no aging going on, this is gonna be pretty much going right into forced carbonation. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna burp it at all or anything like that. Normally I you know put it on CO2, pressurize it, and release a little bit of air off the top just to make sure CO2 is sitting on top of it, uh, the beer, and don't get any oxygenation in there. Uh, but because we're gonna be forced carbonating this like right meow, because I want this ready for Thanksgiving. Um, I'm just gonna take it as it is. I'm gonna rack the whole thing in here, seal up the keg, get it in the Kieser bar, get it under 25 PSI, which is what I force carbonate at. I just leave it at that for a couple days, pull a sample from time to time once it gets to the carbonation level that I like, dial the pressure down, and start serving. Five point nine percent. I stopped it at that level because that's where I wanted it at. The flavor was on point with what I wanted, and uh, I'm very happy with this one. And I will be doing it again. There it is, breakfast of champions. My peanut butter oatmeal stout. Cheers. <laughs>